I won't be narrating all you guys. Okay. Um, so uh, I had a request to remind everyone where we're up to at the moment, uh, in case you're following locally but using the plot. Uh, so what are we doing? Uh, let's study subfactors. That's where we're starting. Okay. Uh, from a subfactor. We can extract a very nice, that stands in for all those adjectives, uh, two categories. Uh, uh, well, in fact, one thing that will happen in a moment is that we're going to say that actually this, this very nice two category is by and large a complete invariant of the subfactor we start with. So we, we're, this thing we're extracting is actually uh, everything we need to study. Somehow, uh, and so uh, we're now gearing up to uh, to study these particularly nice uh, two categories. So we're going to spend basically the whole next hour. Uh, well, first of all, giving a reformulation of what exactly one of these very nice two categories is, and. Uh, and developing a big toolkit for, uh, for for studying them, uh, for constructing them, for showing that ones with certain properties don't exist, and so on. Uh, so we're, that's basically that's basically the idea. We want to study these guys just called subfactors by thinking about their representation theory, the, that collection of fine modules. We can construct this categorical object, and now we need to spend a little while building up a sort of a toolkit adapted to this particular setting. Okay. So I guess the second half, uh, well, of this morning, should get the title uh, Planar Algebras. Yeah. May I make yeah. another request? Yes. Now that I've got the internet, can you write that link back up? Uh, yeah. So uh, I should never have erased it. Uh, so. That's the archive number. My website is tqft.net slash talks. And the first or second link there will be all the notes for there. Okay. Uh, planar algebras uh, and a toolkit for planar algebras. Okay. So, uh, so this, this standard invariant gadget. Is actually equivalent to a thing called a planar algebra. Well, to a uh, particular type of planar algebra, maybe, which we call subtractive planar algebra. So it's just the right sort to describe subtractive. And I'm now going to tell you some complete, some some algebraic gadget. I'm going to tell it to you from complete bare bones. Um, you don't need to know what a category is to understand this definition. But it turns out the thing I'm going to describe is actually exactly the same secretly, uh, and I'll let you in on the secret, <laughs> as that uh, pivotal unitary two category with yada, 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 yada. But this is kind of a completely elementary approach that emphasizes different aspects of the same thing. Planar algebras are always called P, and sometimes you write P subscript bullet. You want people to know that it's a planar algebra kind of thing. It's a type theory. Yeah, look at that. Um, okay, so what does it consist of? Uh, a planar algebra consists of a collection of vector spaces, p subscript n comma plus minus. So n here is some natural number. Two families of vector spaces. And then you have some operations on these vector spaces. Uh, and these operations are indexed by things called planar tangles. Uh, if you want to develop this very formally, you can describe an operat of planar tangles, um, but I'm just going to show you what they are. You can see how to build the operat yourself if you care to. Here is a definition by example. Is T a planar tangle? It consists of a big disk, D naught, along with some interior disks. Yeah. 
disks can survive. Uh, then it consists of uh, some spaghetti. late already, I should have done it in multiple colors so that you can clearly distinguish the disks from the spaghetti, but hopefully my disks are circular enough. It's not too long. Oh, okay. Uh, so this, what is the spaghetti? A, uh, a, a one manifold in uh, D zero minus the DIs. And what else? Uh, uh, a shading of the regions. I will get lazy and not uh, be so colorful later, but uh, let me uh, do it for now. So it's a checkerboard shading respect to that one manifold. Okay. Um, what's, oh, sorry. No. One manifold in black. So, uh, yeah. A checkerboard shading. And finally, what colors do I have? A, uh, a marked point on the, on, uh, somewhere on the boundary of each of the circles. So uh, let's have one of Horn's uh, great innovations in the subject is to use dollar signs. Um, for a long time, everyone used stars, and it was horribly confusing because stars already made three different things in the subject. OK. Um, and uh, a marked point on each circle. You can see from the picture that I mean those marked points to be sort of in between where bits of spaghetti meet them up. Okay, so that's what a planar tangle is. Uh, there's an, uh, an obvious sort of operation on planar tangles, which is that you can take a pair of planar tangles, and if your second one, when you look around its boundary, looks exactly like one of these interior circles, which just means it has the same number of pieces of spaghetti coming into it, and the marked point is in the same shading, and you can glue that second tangle into that disk and make a new bigger planar tangle that has, uh, well, the other interior disks of the first tangle and then all of the interior disks of the second tangle with as little disks inside there. Did that operation make sense? Okay. Okay. Uh, so for each of these planar tangles, what do we have? For each planar tangle, a linear map between these vector spaces. Let me do this. Uh, oh, uh, uh, I guess uh, let me write numbers on these disks. There's some linear ordering. You need to know which one is which. And so, what is this linear map? Well, P associates it's this tangle here, a map from the vector spaces associated to the inner disks. Let me explain how I did that association. I look at disk one and I count how many boundary points it has, or how many bits of spaghetti it has incident, uh, which is four, and I divide that by two, just to be unhelpful. And so I think I'm talking about the vector space P sub two, and then I check whether the marked point is in a shaded or unshaded region, and since it's in a shaded region, I write minus. I then look at the second disk, and I see it's got six boundary points, so I divide by three, being unhelpful, and I'm looking at one of the P3 spaces. The dollar sign is in an unshaded region, so I'm looking at P3 plus. So you go down through all the interior disks, and it's a linear map to the vector space associated with the outer circle. Hopefully that guy has 10 boundary points. The dollar sign is in an unshaded region, so the associated vector space is P5 plus. OK. Uh, so uh, we allow n equals 0. Yes, uh, of course, they're natural numbers. <laughs> uh, OK. So for every single R, um, uh, all of this data is only up to uh, isotopy, rel, the boundaries of the circles. So two pictures here, 
that uh, differ just by moving the spaghetti around a little bit, keeping all the circles fixed, uh, is considered the same tangle, and so it must give you the same map. Okay? And what property do we ask of these maps? Uh, these linear maps uh, composing in the same way as planar tangles. So if you had thought about how to think of the collection of these planar tangles as an operad, we're just saying that this thing is an algebra over that operad. Okay? So what I mean here, if I take some other tangle and glue it into disk 3 here, well, I should be able to get the linear map for the final thing by applying the linear map associated to the, uh, to the tangle I've glued into here, getting its result, plugging it into this circle here, and applying the linear map associated with the outer tangle. And the, uh, the linear map for the composed tangle should be the composition of the, the linear maps, composed in the appropriate way. You're, you're sort of, the inner tangle is, is plugging into one of these tensor factors, according to which disk you're plugging into. Does that definition make sense? Everyone's content with it? Okay. Um, so, not, not a lot of tangles around between the disks inside the tensors? Um, it turns out that writing these axioms down carefully is kind of painful. <laughs> and, and you have two choices. Um, uh, the the cleanest way to write it down actually re requires that you don't move them around. Um, but um, let me let me think. Um, what's the best way to say it? Um, uh, you should think of it as if you can move them around. Is the, is the brief summary. Um, the, you, the thing you have to be careful about is that when you compose, you have to match up dollar signs with dollar signs. And so uh, even as you sort of move these around and rotate them, you still know how you're meant to plug in some other tangle that's drawn on a different piece of the plane uh, because you use the dollar signs to match it. Yeah. Uh, oh. What was that? Yeah, you, you look at the dollar sign for that disk. If the dollar sign is in a shaded region, you write a minus. If the dollar sign is in an unshaded region, you write a plus. The, sh calling them shaded is also a great piece of technology because it works on blackboards and whiteboards and in print. <laughs> um, okay. Why do you have a negative number in it? Because there's a checkerboard shading. So you have to check the condition. That's a condition, yeah. Where we, where I mean, uh, I'm only defining for you subfactor planar algebras. You can go away and invent lots and lots of varieties of planar algebras, and one of the natural things to do is to drop the checkerboard shading and do various other things. But for our case, we really want uh, we really want a, uh, this checkerboard shading. So the number of points is even, and so for historical reasons, we divide everything by two just to just to annoy me, um, and uh, that's how things are. Okay, so um, let me. Delete this because I want to keep that picture visible while I say this. Uh, we're now going to uh, add a few more adjectives onto this um, to, to get to the actual special case of a subfactor planar algebra. So, uh, let's see. So, a planar algebra is, uh, let's say, it's evaluable the dimensions. P0 plus or minus spaces are one. That's basically saying if you build some picture with empty boundary around the outside, uh, you can evaluate it in some way to get a, to get a number in this, uh, in this space, P0 plus or minus associated to pictures with empty boundary. Uh, we say that it's spherical uh, if Say I construct this picture here, I take my x in uh, P2, maybe I can write a, double, a dollar sign, so it's P2 plus, and I apply this tangle, oh, sorry, P1 plus, sorry, um, and I apply this tangle to get an element of P0 uh, plus, uh, 
a, I haven't drawn here sort of the, the outer circle here with, with zero marked points on it because it's generally worth omitting those if you can possibly help it. Uh, if we say it's spherical if this picture, which gives some number in this vector space here, okay, uh, where it gives us some vector, some number in P0 plus, is the same always as this picture here. Sorry. Uh, which is an element of P0 minus. That's a daft definition, because we <laughs> ask that two things are equal in different vector spaces. The point is that P0 plus and minus have a canonical element in them, given by the empty tangle. The tangle with no input disks, no spaghetti, no nothing, gives a map from the complex numbers, this empty tensor product associated to the, the absence of interior disks, to P0 plus and P0 minus. So the empty picture gives you canonical elements in, in these vector spaces, so we, we implicitly identify these with the complex numbers, and then it makes sense to, to do this comparison. And spherical here, you can imagine what it means, where we're imagining swinging that strand there around the back of some sphere to get to this picture. Uh, yeah, so dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign. So yeah, this is this here is taking our x in p one plus and giving us an element of p zero minus. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, you you can you can give a more general thing that uh, that still makes sense. Uh, okay, it's unitary. If there is an anti-linear map bar on each of the vector spaces back to itself, uh, intertwining reflection of cleaner tangles. So if I have some elements of these vector spaces, I take their bar, I take the bars of all of them, and I apply some, some, some planar tangle, I should get the same result as if I didn't bar them, but I applied the reflected planar tangle and then bar them at the end. Okay? That's what uh, intertwining reflection of planar tangles means. Don't, don't worry too much. Uh, so for that, so there's this anti-linear thing that we should think of as, as being exactly like reflecting an element, uh, such that this inner product so two elements in Pn plus, given by, well, you take your x and you uh, bar it, and you take your y and you leave it the same, and then you hook up all of their, uh, all of their strings. Okay, so these start by dollar, dollar, and the uh, invisible circle on the outside. Okay, so this thing is just some number because we're evaluable, and this is in, in, a, in a P0 plus space, so that this is a positive definite number. Uh, and one more adjective, um, which admittedly in the literature uh, always just goes in the first part of the definition here, but it should be said. Um, it's bosonic. If uh, this tangle uh, corresponding to sort of the, the two pi rotation, some number of strings is always equal to, to one. And uh, even saying this, even if sort of interacts with the question you're asking about whether you're allowed to move things around on the inside, we're just going to always ask this, this condition. So you really can move things freely. But surprisingly, there are examples uh, that sort of are like super tensor categories or something for these things. Um, okay, and a subfactor planar algebra uh, is all of these things. It's a planar algebra with all of these beautiful adjectives. So, subfactor planar algebra. Okay, um, 
what I want to do next is just quickly show you how to go back and forth from uh, a planar algebra to that two category that we were talking about before. Uh, so what order to do this in? Because it sort of doesn't matter. Um, let's, let's build a planar algebra from a standard invariant. Okay, so remember, so here we start with uh, C, the pivotal two category, and in that we have X, some object A to B. So A and B are the, are the objects, and X is a one morphism in that two category. And just from that data, we're going to build a, a plan. It doesn't matter actually. I mean, if there are more objects and, and more one morphisms beside X, uh, that's fine. You can start with that. But we're only going to see the part of C uh, generated by X. So what do we do? We just define P n plus to be the A A morphisms from the identity on A to X tensor X dual tensor dot 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 tensor X dual where here there are two n factors. Okay? And we define P n minus to be hom of the BB homes, the identity one morphism on B, to the other thing that you can do with x, x dual tensor x, tensor dot dot dot, tensor x. And again, uh, two n factors. Okay? So there's some collection of vector spaces extracted from this object x in a pivotal two category. Uh, now, of course, I wrote this by taking the homes from the identity to two n factors there. But of course, because we're pivotal, I could have just written some number of factors of x tensor x dual here and some other number over there that added up to two n. And I'd always get the same vector space. Okay. Uh, so this is sort of an example of how the planar algebra is a, a throwing out a, an artificial distinction on the pivotal category side. We only have one of those vector spaces, not many. Okay. To define the action of planar tangles, uh, first uh, isotope them to a standard form. I'm going to draw my planar tangle in a big box because, of course, to do something too categorical, I have to work with lumpy asymmetrical rectangles instead of beautiful round circles. Uh, I arrange it like this, all my, all my interior boxes, boxes lined up in a line. Uh, all of my pieces of spaghetti entering and leaving them, entering and leaving the top edges of the boxes. Okay. And then I just read this picture as uh, uh, as, a, as an instruction in the in the two category, I just start from the bottom. From the bottom to the top. And as I read upwards along here, I'll occasionally pass critical points. And when I pass critical points, I'll use the evaluation or co-evaluation maps for x. Uh, promised to me by being a pivotal category. And when I pass one of these boxes, I will just use the map from the identity one morphism to some number of tensor copies of x with x dual. Okay? So if you, if you plug in here elements x, y, and z from that definition, this whole thing here is just an element of the appropriate vector space for the, the number of boundary points we have in the top. Okay? Uh, and um, the fact that cups and caps in a pivotal category play well tells you that this is well-defined and that this action of planar tangles satisfies the requirements that we had that they compose well together. I saw a few physical faces in the audience there, so complain or not. I don't understand. PN depends on X or not? Yes, yes. So, so you're starting here with a, a pivotal two category and uh, and your favorite one morphism. Uh, 
and depending on which favorite one morphism you have, you will get a different planar algebra. Yes, but the downside is the CX. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. That was a silly matter to use. Sorry. Um, uh, sorry, I just meant. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. These are just yeah elements of those p n plus and minus spaces, which in particular are two morphisms. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So you, the thing that you should think here is that a planar algebra is a pivotal two category along with the choice of your favorite generating one more. Mm. Axiomatized slightly differently. And going back the other way, the whole standard invariant can be recovered, uh, well, at least as much of it as XCs can be recovered like this. So, uh, so we. we we have just have objects A and B. And I just make sort of some silly things to start with here that I just declare that home from A to A, so these are the one morphisms, home from B to B are both even natural numbers. And I declare that home from A to B, home from B to A, Odd natural numbers. And then I make the following definitions. The AA homes from 2n to 2m are just, uh, well, uh, these guys, which is, just means P n plus m on a plus. Okay? So I just declare those sorts of home spaces to be the n plus m space in the planar algebra. And similarly, home uh, from b to b, from 2n to 2m, I ask, I declare that to be p n plus m comma minus. And then home from a to b, from some odd number to some other odd number, which means out the right thing is n plus m plus 1 plus um, a. So I'm just defining some two category here by telling you all of the home spaces p n plus m plus 1 minus. Okay, now I need to finish by telling you the the operations, uh, uh, composition, by which I mean composition of two morphisms, uh, is just stacking. It's a product, by which I mean composition of one morphism, is uh, horizontal juxtaposition. Let me check that these things, um, these planar tangles I'm drawing here, give you the correct sorts of operations on all these home spaces for this to be a two category. Uh, the pivotal structure is obvious because um, in, uh, in this space with two boundary points at the bottom and no boundary points at the top, the planar algebra gives you a canonical element given by drawing a cup, thinking of that as a planar tangle. Uh, so it gives you this element. That's what uh, you use as the evaluation map in the pivotal category. Everything fits together. Uh, and finally, at the end, you might want to add a potent complete at, the, at the, all of those two morphism spaces. Because it seems a little funny that our objects here, our one morphisms here, were just natural numbers. What does this mean? It means that we're thinking at first as if the objects are just the tensor powers of x with x dual. But then when we add a potent complete, we recover all of those sum x. That's going back and forth between a standard invariant and a planar algebra. And we're going to mostly talk about planar algebras rather than pivotal two categories. Okay? Oh god, it's almost already quarter to twelve. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So I want to tell you uh, um, how do people feel about this translation? Have said that the shadows correspond to the objects of the, the shadows 
correspond to radiating regions. The shadings, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, exactly, the, uh, the, uh, the unshaded regions are A and the shaded regions are B. Okay, so what's the point of planar algebras? Obviously, they're just the little two categories. I mean, there's, with a choice of favorite, one morphism. There can't possibly be anything exciting about that. But the whole point of planar algebras is that they uh, suggest to you a different set of operations, a different kind of uh, set of algebraic things to think about than uh, merely composition and tensor product. And uh, there really is genuinely uh, some mileage to be made out of that. So I want to start uh, explaining uh, the, the new things we get from the, the planar algebra perspective. So I want to tell you three things about planar algebras, which are kind of cool. Uh, so first of all, uh, the temporally Lieb algebra, uh, planar algebra, uh, well, uh, is initial. There are actually lots of different temporally leave algebras indexed by a parameter delta. Um, so they're initial for planar algebras with uh, circle equal delta. So circle shaded on the inside. Okay? So in particular, there's just a map. T or D, T or delta, sitting inside whatever planar algebra you like, as long as those parameters are okay. So you've got something sitting inside every single planar algebra. I'll come back and describe that. Uh, every planar algebra with principal graph uh, gamma embeds in a, uh, in a entirely combinatorially defined planar algebra called the graph planar algebra. And you can unpack this and translate this result back to, the, to something about pivotal two categories. And um, it's something that I think is rather poorly understood. Um, and I think that it's probably worth having a very abstract, nonsensey kind of interpretation of what this theorem is saying. I definitely don't know. Um, so I think that this is a great audience for really understanding what's going on. Uh, and the final one, which is maybe the most spectacular, is that the annular temporally Lieb uh, uh, one category uh, acts on every planar algebra uh, and we can decompose into irreducibles. Because every planar algebra naturally has this one category acting on it, and it turns out we can very explicitly understand the representation theory of that one category and uh, uh, analyze the planar algebra from this perspective of how it decomposes into annular temporary modules. Okay. Uh, okay. So let me say a little bit about temporary. So temporally Lieb is a planar algebra. Let me define uh, the prime on it first. We'll, uh, we'll uh, fix it later to do the real thing. So this, this is some planar algebra. And uh, so I'm describing the n box space. Uh, there's a plus or minus there, but I'll mostly ignore it. So it's just linear combinations of crossingless matchings Two endpoints, so eg TL3 is just linear combinations following five diagrams. And maybe I, I should uh, go back and put a dollar sign in the same place in all of these. So how do planar tangles uh, 
act on, on these pictures. Well, you can just take a collection of these pictures and glue them into the, the holes in a planar rectangle, and you get a, a new picture that looks exactly like this, except it possibly has some closed circles in it, okay? Which isn't allowed in this definition here. So, so we just say planar tangles. What's different about the last two of those pictures? Oh, uh, that I drew that I didn't draw them correctly. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh -huh. I, I, I put the dollar sign in the wrong place because I slightly irritated things as I was going along. Okay. Uh, so planar tangles act by gluing. And here's where the parameter comes in. Anytime you see a closed circle, you just delete it and put a multiplicative factor of the ultimate. <coughs> okay? And so uh, the map uh, TL delta into some arbitrary planar algebra is just uh, interpreting these pictures as, uh, as zero input planar tangles. Okay? You think of them as a zero input planar tangle, which they give you a map from the complex numbers to the appropriate space, it's that fixed out one. What's a delta? Uh, delta is this parameter to controlling what uh, closed circles are equal to. When we glue these things together, closed loops form, which aren't allowed, the things we're taking linear combinations of. So, so but what is it? What is the kind of thing you did? Uh, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, uh, a complex number, okay. an element of your favorite field, green, whatever you're working over. Uh, Okay, so uh, somehow this is the, I, like, I think this is the most fundamental example of two category theory. Uh, so uh, if you haven't, if you don't know and love it already, you should be, you should be deeply embarrassed. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, okay, so let's say a little bit about the structure of this thing. So TL delta prime is non-degenerate. So what do I mean by non-degenerate? Uh, Remember there is this, uh, um, well, uh, non-degenerate means that for every diagram here, we can find some other linear combination of diagrams, well, for every linear combination of diagrams, we can find some other linear combination of diagrams to glue it together with, which will produce some number, so that that number is non zero. okay? It's just a pairing, gluing two diagrams together and evaluating all the closed loops as delta is a, is a pairing on the spaces and we'll let go into the non-degenerate. Except when uh, delta is a special number of the form 2 cosine pi over n. Uh, it is positive definite, meaning that pairing I was talking about is, is a positive definite inner product uh, for delta greater than or equal to 2. Uh, when delta is one of these special numbers, The radical the kernel of that pairing is generated uh, by a particular thing. So there's this anytime. So anytime we have some two category like this, uh, there's this. Uh, there's this. There's, uh, sorry. Anytime we have a pivotal two category like this, there's this ideal of the degenerate things, the things that, that uh, pair with anything else to be zero, and we can completely describe this. This radical in the temporary leap world, it's generated by the n minus first uh, Jones Benzel eigenvalue. We'll come to that in just a second. And, uh, and the quotient is positive. After you kill off this radical, the remaining thing is, is, is a positive definite uh, two category. And uh, the definition of the real temporary leave without the prime is uh, <coughs> is quotient by the back. These theorems, these theorems are, are relatively hard. Uh, they're not something that I'm going to try and explain in detail. But, uh, but they're also elementary. You play with lots of diagrams to get okay. So let me tell you uh, what the jones mental adimpotents are, and then using those, we'll be able to understand uh, what the principal graph of this planar algebra is in all of these different cases. But the, but the important thing to remember is, uh, is this thing here. Every planar algebra has a copy of temporary loops in it. 
You know, sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit indecisive about parts of my talk to speed up or skip over. It's possible that terms means all adverts are going to be one of them. I was going to talk quite a bit about transcendental adipotents, um, but let me let me just not talk about them at all. And uh, at the point we need them later, uh, we can come back and uh, say a little bit about them. That unfortunately involves me skipping over um, some some other examples of planar algebra. Uh, maybe during lunchtime someone can ask me. So, tell me more examples of planar algebras. Okay, so let's uh, head on a little bit and just say what this annular template leaf gadget is. So, uh, planar tangles with one input disk form a category. Okay, the number of boundary points on the circle. Uh, gives you the object, uh, and whether the shading, whether the marked point is shaded or not, gives you a little bit more information. Uh, so, what are the morphisms? The morphisms are just pictures. Like this. Planar tangle with one input disk and then some spaghetti and shadings here. So this is an object, this is a morphism between two comma plus uh, to uh, five comma minus. Okay. And then any uh, any planar algebra is obviously a representation of this category. Vector space associated to each object, n comma plus minus, is obviously just the n comma plus minus space of the planar algebra, and then morphisms map between those vector spaces in exactly the way that you want. Uh, so let's understand the representation theory of this one category, and it turns out that you can describe it very explicitly. Um, at least let's just do it for delta strictly greater than two. Later, that's going to turn out to be all of the interesting stuff. Um, remember, uh, uh, delta is the square root. Delta is the value of the loop. Uh, delta is the square root of the index. And I said that since the mid '90s, we've understood index less than four. So this is really the interesting regime for studying more subfactors. Uh, and so we'll just stay with you there. Okay. Here is of annular temporary leave. Uh, annular temporary leave. Uh, are indexed by, well, there's two classes of them. One class is indexed by a pair, n comma omega, in a positive number, an omega and n root of unity. Or there's another class, which we don't really need to worry about so much, indexed by, uh, well, just a single number, d, it's positive in between zero and delta. The representation is just a functor in the vector space. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so in particular, for each object of vector space and the collection of maps connecting those vector spaces. Uh, and these representations you can, so you can sort of uh, show very explicitly. Uh, these are realized by uh, sort of By a sort of a cyclic, a cyclic vector, that is, all of these representations have a single vector in one of those vector spaces, so that everything in, the, in all of those vector spaces is obtained by applying maps from uh, applying morphisms from annular temporal root to it. Uh, 
uh, it's called like vector v, that vector space, that vector v lives in the nth vector space. Let's call it just, let's just say it's in the plus vector space, and that's the end there. Okay? And you can completely describe uh, how annular tangles act on that vector v by the following pictures. You take your vector v and apply a cap to it anywhere, you always get zero. And if you take your vector v and uh, rotate it uh, two clicks. So we have to rotate two clicks in order to get back to the same shading as we had before. This v is in vn plus, and so when I pull two strings around there, uh, I get another element of vn plus. And the condition is just that that two click rotation is just omega times the vector that we started with. And you can see the condition now why uh, we like to have the nth power of omega to be one, so the full rotation of this is, uh, is the other. Okay. Um, or, <coughs> well, uh, there's this other class of representations <coughs> where V is a zero box. <coughs> so it's some little picture with no boundary <coughs> points coming out. <coughs> and the relation there is that if you have V and you draw a piece of spaghetti around it, usually closed bits of spaghetti give you factors of delta. But in these other representations, a closed bit of spaghetti surrounding a V gives you D times V to this other weird number of D. Those representations don't matter. So, so much. OK. So what, what do we have here? Uh, we can decompose a planar algebra as a direct sum. Uh, oh, sorry, I, sh I should say more. I mean, uh, uh, the irreducible representations are these, and it's, it's semi-simple. Everything decomposes uniquely into symbols. So we can do this decomposition. And uh, we can always write something like this. It's a direct sum over n of direct sums over, over z's, which are basically just n roots of unity, of some number of copies of this representation indexed by, uh, by, by n and z. OK? And we say uh, that p has magic numbers. Yes, yes. It has an ATL module. Yeah. We're forgetting all the operations except the single independence. We say that P has magic numbers A n, where you just uh, take the sum over over different roots of unity of the numbers of of the of the A n z's. Okay? So this is just counting. Uh, when you decompose P into irreducible representations, how many generating vectors are there in the n-box space? That's what this counting the magic numbers into. How many, how, many, uh, how many vectors satisfying these two conditions are there for some value of omega in the n-box space? And this sequence of numbers is essentially, well, an extremely powerful invariant of, uh, of the planar algorithm. And shortly, We'll, we'll be able to discuss some relationships between the sequence of numbers and the index. And uh, so once we say we're working in small index, we'll have strong control of this, and we'll uh, understand how the planar algebra decomposes in this way, and we'll, uh, we'll really get <coughs> Okay, um, let me, um, okay. let me go over by five or 10 minutes to say what a graph planar algebra is, and to, to tell you that that last step in the uh, in the toolkit of studying planar algebras, this embedding theorem in the graph planar algebra, and then we can stop for lunch. And after lunch, we'll come back and apply all of these bits of the toolkit to uh, prove some things about planar algebras. Okay, so the. The point of the, the graph planar algebra is that uh, we're just going to define some planar algebra solely using the principal graph. And uh, it's going to be pretty straightforward. We're just going to say that, uh, let's see. 
We just need to find a bunch of vector spaces and actions of planar tangles on them, just using the data of the principal graph. So here's the graph planar algebra associated to gamma. We're going to use a little bit more than the graph than the graph itself. We're also going to use d. What's d here? d is the dimension function. So it's the dimension, the categorical dimension of each simple object. Okay. So along with no, that is for each vertex of gamma. Those are the simple objects. We have some number d, and we're going to use that number d in the definition. Okay. So what is this graph planar algebra? Well, the uh, the n comma plus space is just loops, or linear combinations of loops of length two n on gamma. Now remember that gamma, the principal graph, had two components for the left a modules and the left b modules. And that's how the plus and minus comes in. We either take loops on, the, on one of the components or loops on the other component. Um, now, uh, what is the action of planar? So there are some vector spaces. Um, I need to tell you the action of planar tangles. Uh, so, this is very schematically here, let me have some planar tangle. Okay. And I'm going to act on a, uh, a collection of vectors that I plug into those in our, in our loops. So here, v1, v2, and v3, I should think of as being some loop on the principal graph of the appropriate length. Because everything is linear, I don't have to worry about linear combinations. I can just tell you the answer for a, a given collection of loops. And what is this? Well, I've got to tell you now some new loop on the graph, Okay, coming from that. And what I'm going to do, sorry, let me change my change here. I, I said linear combinations, um, but let me, it's maybe better to think about sort of uh, linear functionals on that. So for each loop, we, we've got the coefficient of that loop. And so what I'm going to do here is given uh, the, the, a collection of input loops in this planar tangle, I'm going to tell you the coefficient that you get when you look at this on some particular loop, okay? So my remaining task is just to just write down a number, okay? And then I've defined the action of planar tangles. Okay, well, it's something kind of crazy. It's the sum over states, by which I mean uh, label regions in the planar tangle by vertices. Uh, so let me make this planar tangle a little complicated. So a state here is going to be an assignment of some vertex of the graph to every region in here in a compatible way. So if I have two labels on opposite sides of a strand, I want to ask that they are adjacent vertices on the principal graph. I also want to demand that these labelings are consistent with all of these loops that I'm plugging in. I've got V1 written here, which is some loop on the principal graph. In particular, that tells me some sequence of four vertices on the principal graph. And so I demand, this, demand that the regions meeting around V1 here are exactly those, those vertices that V1 is passing through. And similarly, around the boundary, I demand that I can see V0. Okay? So very often, this sum is just the one element sum, a, a one element indexing set here, because in fact, all of the region labels are just determined by, uh, by the loops that I'm plugging in here. Okay? Sometimes there may be a little closed loop in the planar tangle, and then you've got a sum over ways of labeling that by the vertex of the graph. And then what you do, well, <clears throat> you just have some, you just have some numerical factor here. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a product over critical points. So I mean, uh, minima and maxima appearing on the strands in this picture of some factor associated to, so here we've got some state S that we're summing over, which is this product of the critical points, and there's just some numerical factor sort of associated to a pair, a critical point, and a state where this numerical factor is, is totally ridiculously the square root 
of the dimension of the vertex above that critical point. So C, C is a critical point, so C plus here, I have in mind sort of that in a given state, would label the regions by C plus above the critical point and C minus below the critical point. If we define it by doing C minus. Okay. What the hell is this thing? Um, I, I've defined for you now uh, a, a planar element. Okay, told you the vector space is for each planar tangle acting on some particular loops. I told you the coefficient of an arbitrary other loop in the, in the appropriate vector space by this weird formula. Uh, now, uh, okay, and then the, the theorem is, of course, that the original. Graph, the original planar algebra from which we extracted gamma and d uh, sits inside and embeds inside that, that graph planar algebra. Now, this is this looks kind of crazy, and where on earth did I come up with this definition of the of the, the planar tangle, of the action of planar tangles? And uh, there is actually an explanation. It's not quite as bad as it looks staring at it right now. Uh, but um, the, the rough idea is that there's an explanation via to write a bureau TQFTs. Um, so the, the basic idea is that anytime you have a pivotal two category, that gives you some scheme for associating vector spaces to two maps. TQFT in such a way that when you glue two manifolds together, you have gluing, you have maps between the associated vector spaces. And basically, the idea here is that the graph planar algebra is uh, uh, well a collection of Turaya-Vero vector spaces uh, for uh, the cylinder. While uh, the uh, while the the um, while the vector spaces of this planar algebra uh, is so a collection of derived zero vector spaces, uh, just the disk, and really the 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 real theorem that's being proved here. Is that if you think of B3, some three manifold, as a cobordism, a cylinder to a pair of disks, well, it's an isomorphism because it's, a, it's an invertible three manifold between those things. And uh, this theorem is, in, is coming from uh, looking at the map back this way and picking a trivial element of one of these disks, and that then gives you a map that roughly looks like map from the vector spaces for the planar algebra over to the vector spaces that says over to the same. Um, the thing to say about this is that this is a much nicer understanding of the graph planar algebra embedding theorem than we ever used to have, um, but it's still kind of a big detour to, to explain how, the, how you get this theorem, having to go through all this DQFT stuff. And I think that um, it's perfectly plausible that there's actually a much more direct and cleaner story uh, that starts with some pivotal two category and uh, in some very simple way describes this combinatorial gadget and explains why there is a visit spatial map from one to the other. Uh, but I, I really don't know that story in a way that uh, doesn't involve TQFT. Um, let me just say one or two. Okay. Let me just give one or two little corollaries of that theorem and then we can all go have lunch because it's time to be hungry. Um, uh, okay, so, uh, well, just to sort of 
obviously a wonderful thing to give a sense uh, of, of the sort of thing that you can do using this theorem. So C uh, gamma starts like this. It starts with just a chain of three equals, and then it forks, and then they continue just like that. And let's call those P and Q. And let's say P and Q do not connect at the next step. Okay? So there's not uh, there's not some vertex here at the next depth connected to both P and Q. This is a sort of example of corollary of the planar algebra of the theorem. Then uh, gamma is in fact equal to This particular graph and uh, the subfactor is uh, well, is some particular non-subfactor that we'll mention in it later. Uh, and so you should you should think of this as kind of telling you that uh, in many cases, if you know a little bit about the principal graph, you have very strong control of what this graph planar algebra is. And there's just not room to embed uh, a, a planar, the planar algebra you're after into there. There's just not enough room to have a something that's injective but still respects all the planar algebra operations. Uh, and so this is a, to my mind, a very strange sort of result. But um, but also things like this are very powerful for uh, understanding what subfactors are possible. In the okay. Um, I'm sorry that was that was too rushed, but I wanted to tell you those three things that you can do with planar algebras, and then when we come back from lunch, we're actually going to use them, and we're going to classify some, some planar algebras and construct some other ones, um, and uh, try to get towards the theorem. Okay, thanks.